Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for participating in uh, this uh, panel debate with uh, the team Scaling Up CCS. What are the challenges? My name is Leif Johan Sevland, being the CEO and President of the ONS Foundation in Stavanger, Norway. And um, of course, uh, the CCS, the discussion, the team we have on the agenda to this afternoon is highly relevant uh, for ONS as an energy meeting place. And we have been looking forward to the debates, discussions, your questions and remarks. And we all know that uh, the political leaders, the, uh, the industry leaders, they have been together. They have been together many places, last in Glasgow, setting up the aim uh, for the net zero society. And uh, very important in that respect is actually, how could the industry participate? What can the industry do to be a part of the solution uh, for the future and for the net zero society? CCS is, of course, one very important part of uh, the future uh, on our travel to the net zero society. It's not the only solution, it's just an important part of what we're going to discuss and debate. And as you all know, even in the CCA, CCS issues, there are plenty of uh, challenges, there are plenty of uh, things to discuss, a uh, new kind of way of working together, technology, economy, whatever it should be, they're all there. Uh, and it's also important to, um, to know that when we are uh, discussing this, uh, we'd like to highlight um, also, I know there's a lot of projects going on all over the world. It's a lot of fascinating things to read, uh, but also uh, for the ONS Foundation to see what's happening in the North Sea is of course uh, extremely uh, interesting. Uh, and knowing that we in a way could be a world-class laboratorium uh, for new uh, value chains of uh, ecosystems within energy. And then, of course, it's not uh, only CCS, it's CCS, but it's also hydrogen. It's about offshore wind. It might be floating uh, solar, or solar, whatever it should be, which is a part of the new uh, energy solutions. We have to discuss these um, issues, these challenges, uh, and to address the future. I'm so glad that so many people were able to join us this afternoon. A warm welcome to all of you. And I would like to end my three minutes of fame uh, with introducing uh, today's uh, moderator. Uh, and uh, proud that uh, we have uh, Sima uh, Mera uh, together with us. Sima is the vice president and the business head of the TECS Energy and Resources uh, uh, Verticals. Uh, and is passionate, I know, uh, Sima, about uh, the climate change and diversity and inclusion. You have also uh, featured at the ONS uh, Energy Talks, uh, speaking then about the energy transition at oil and gas companies. To all of you, a warm welcome. And to you, uh, Shima, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leif. Uh, it is truly my privilege to be a co-host for this roundtable. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all the panelists and the audience. Today in our panel, we have leaders who have deep expertise on carbon capture and storage, as well as real life projects. Today in the round table, we'll discuss multiple facets and dimensions of CCS. So let me start the day today with James McKay. He's the managing director for OGC's Project Capital. In his earlier role, he has led the finance team for Apex Clean Energy and MA for Next Nextra Energy. James is on the management committees and boards of several CCS initiatives. I invite James to set the context for us with a keynote on the need for carbon capture and storage and the challenges in scaling it up. A warm welcome to you, James. Over to you. Thank you very much, Seema. And um, looking at the uh, the attendees that we have sort of across the globe, I'll, I'll just say, you know, good afternoon and good morning and good evening to, to those of you um, that have joined us from many different places. Um, I, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I've been spending the past couple of years of my career focused um, on greenhouse gas emission uh, activity. Um, CCUS has been a very big part of that. 
And what I'd like to do is share a few slides with you to, to, to talk about the topic that I was asked to address, which is accelerating the race to net zero uh, with CCS. So um, just setting the, the, the context uh, for this, um, these are numbers that, that I think most of the people in this audience are familiar with, but if we look at the 50 gigatons of man-made emissions by sector, um, you know, many of these, uh, I, many of these can be addressed with a number of, uh, uh, you know, technologies and projects and solutions that we have capabilities for today. In fact, I would say that um, CCS uh, can address really 75% of this pie. Um, it's been a very major uh, part of the initiatives for OGCI climate investments. Um, we have three main focuses. Uh, one of them is reducing methane emissions in the upstream and midstream sectors. But then the, the two remaining pillars of our focus are focused specifically on, on carbon. One is the reduction of carbon, and then what we refer to as recycling of carbon, which is essentially uh, CCUS. Now, um, it's no accident that the, the title for, for, for my speech is about the race. Uh, to net zero, and it really is a race. Th this is something where we are dealing, uh, you know, with a time limit. And uh, this is a, a graph with data from the Climate Action Tracker that I think is is very uh, telling about the the challenge that we have before us immediately. Um, the the red line on this graph basically shows, um, you know, what our emissions look like if we just maintain the status quo. And then to you know get to a 1.5 degree Celsius uh, level, we need to follow you know policies that address this yellow line. So not only is there a very big gap, and not only are we only uh, you know have we only addressed globally policies you know that can deliver half of the problem. The big thing we need to remember is that the longer we wait to implement solutions, the steeper the curve needs to be. So if we if we implement uh, you know, actions today, we can reach this level by 2060 with as little as 10 million tons per year. If we go all the way out to 2040 before we take real action, then we need to reduce it by 40 gigatons per year. So this truly is a race and the time for action you know, is now. Every, every year that we delay, we are making our challenge of saving the planet more difficult. This is something that requires bold action um, from all participants, um, you know, private sector and public sector. Um, I was reviewing the, uh, the, the participants and, and attendees lists um, shortly before joining the, this morning's presentation. And it's very encouraging to me that we have representation from all stakeholders. We have, uh, we have regulators, uh, legislators, uh, private and, and public uh, industry. We have uh, consultants, producers, service providers, uh, we have so much expertise that that is joining this topic today that that is very encouraging to me. And you know what I like to point out with this particular graphic is that you know all of these elements are necessary and we all have to work together. But it's very encouraging to me that we have a lot of activity that is advancing uh, in terms of policy support, uh, both in North America and in Europe and in Asia. There are policies that are advancing that. Uh, are providing the incentives to get CCUS solutions installed. Um, regulations are very important because not only is it is it an expensive solution that requires policy incentives, but if we go back to my point about the time, um, we can't we can't have uh, success if it takes eight years to get you know, a one megaton CCS project installed. So regulators need to get involved and address permitting timelines and streamline so that developers and producers that, that are shifting in the energy transition can deploy their solutions much faster and not be held up in red tape. Uh, uh, industry is providing 
uh, you know, voluntary solutions. There's really quite a, a, a takeoff in voluntary carbon markets um, that, that's very helpful because these projects, they all need revenue solutions and not every part of the, the world has something like a 45Q tax credit that we have in the United States. So, uh, you know, every country, every culture has their own way of providing incentives, but that also means that, you know, every participant globally has something to contribute to this. And, and finally, um, you know, I'd say that from the, the financial point of view, um, you know, my focus is addressing this through the deployment of capital. And there is a tremendous amount of capital that needs to be deployed into this. Uh, you, you know, pick your number, but anywhere from three to five trillion dollars per year of capital is necessary to achieve the the you know the 1.5 uh, C level that that we're looking at. But we're seeing a lot of response to that. We've had uh, major global financial institutions pledge an aggregate of 130 trillion dollars. Um, over the next, I believe, 20 years to, um, you, you know, to address these things. And we're seeing pressure from asset managers uh, that, that realize that their stakeholders are demanding a lower carbon footprint uh, across all businesses. Um, we've seen this work very well. Um, you know, in the United States, we had uh, a previous administration that was not as active in supporting uh, climate action. But during the period of 2017 to 2021, if you look at the renewable energy uh, growth in the United States, it really took off because private customers were demanding it. And uh, I see uh, a lot of parallels between the renewable energy complex and what we're trying to do in the rest of the energy transition, including um, carbon capture and storage. Uh, and, and finally, just, um, you know, as an example, there are so many opportunities that I find very attractive, not just as, uh, you know, a, a climate activist, but as an investor. Um, you know, within our portfolio, we have, uh, you know, eight investments that span both technology advancements, uh, capture, storage, uh, and transportation of CO2. We have a ninth that is going to be announced shortly. And these are th these are things that um, I, as a profit-oriented investor, uh, am very excited about. So um, we are very excited about this opportunity. Larry Fink from BlackRock, he just put out a, a statement uh, uh, in the last couple of days that uh, energy transition investing is the most exciting and the largest opportunity for investors that this generation is going to see. And uh, so that, that's something that I'm very excited about. I hope everyone uh, that's participating today shares my excitement and uh, I welcome and challenge all of you uh, to, to join me on this journey of uh, you know, doing well by doing good. Thank you. Thank you, James. That was that was very encouraging. Now that James has set out the context uh, contest for the discussion, I'll ask for a view from our audience. I think you'll be seeing a audience poll question on your screen right now. You can select only one option. While the uh, audience is looking at the polls, I would like to invite Dr. Lene. Lene is a board member of North Shell and shells face to various industries that seek to reduce their carbon footprint with cleaner energy and low carbon solutions. Prior to her current load, Lene had led research and innovation alliances at Shell. Interestingly, she has personal experience with hard to abate sectors like steel with leadership roles in research and innovation. Welcome Lene. Over Thank you, you, Seema. Thank you. Um, I, I have an echo. I'm not sure. That's coming from. OK, the echo is gone. Um, I had just a couple of slides just a little bit to guide. Uh, so let me just put them up.
just one check. Can can everybody see the slides? Good, thank you. I'm not sure if this is in presentation mode. So um, it's an honor being here today and also being amongst these esteemed experts around this virtual table and looking at the guest list. We also had the pleasure to see a lot is in this virtual room present also with a lot of experience and expertise in this area. In um, my daily life, I am actually working um, with the decarbonizing options that we can offer to suppliers and customers of Shell. And one of them is, of course, the CCS story, but we, of course, have many others. And um, what the previous speaker was also touching upon, the hard to abate sectors, and that's an area I work uh, very actively in. And when we say hard to abate, let, just me, let me clarify for me, it is the metal sector that's working with the major steel companies, aluminium companies, or other exotic metals. And um, just want to make sure that if you're not aware of it, it's not an easy manufacturing sector to decarbonize. There's a reason why they need so much energy and also in the, you could say, in in their first phases of their process. So they, of course, also look for solutions that could help them to decarbonize. And one of them, depending on where they are in the world, is CCS. Um, I'm always a little bit trying to make sure that we just realize that CCS is a proven technology. And it's been in operation for decades. And, and when I say this, Solvents have been used for it since the 30s. And, and of course, we've also been transporting it in pipelines since the 70s. And there's quite a lot of kilometers of pipelines. And of course, in the storage part, we've also used it uh, um, for quite some time. So when we look at this, then you can see we have the capture, the transport and the storage. And I like the poll, I must say, because I think there might be some coming back later on, but it might relate to that some of the building blocks to decarbonize through CCS are in space. So what's what's actually um, limiting us? If I then go back to what I was sharing, my area where it's iron and steel and also some of the others, then you can see here why CCS is essential for the decarbonization. And, and you can also, um, where it is actually, uh, could be really, really important. And uh, this is um, a study from McKinsey where they tried a little bit like how you could look at the CCS and you see here where it is actually going to happen for cement and also when you see the ethylene and also other industries, but also where it is already applied. So, and you see here also the examples, um, what the United Arab Emirates are doing, but also in the US. So we are making, well, I say some steps in this space, but what's keeping us back? Then I also, and this is also a personal belief, that it has a key role to play. And I think uh, the gentleman before me also made that very clear, why it is, it, it is really something that could provide the society quite a lot, also by creating and retaining jobs, but also accelerating the deployment of it. But what does that demand? And that was why I like the questions before, because there is certainly a, a need to unlock some of the finances to make this happen. If I look at the hard to abate sectors, um, they also need help to make this happen. And the investment of this is, of course, also um, a huge one, but also um, how can we encourage the public support for it? And um, that was a little bit what I had prepared just to make sure I don't take the time away from my other panel members, but just a little bit to set the scene from our side. Thank you. Thank you, Lene. I uh, thank you for giving your insights on how CCS is crucial, especially for the heavy industries and hard to abate industries in the metal sector. Thank you so much. I now invite Torbjorn Fossen, the Vice President of Global CCS Solutions for Econor. Of course, Econor is uniquely qualified in the field of CCS with more than two decades of operational experience in CCS. Uh, she heads, uh, Torbjorn heads the Econor's effort to develop CCS as a regional solution to decarbonize European industry. I warmly welcome you, Torbjorn. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. 
and also the opportunity to take part of uh, this session here today. Um, I hope you can see my screen now because it disappeared for me. Yeah, good. <laughs> so what I plan to do during my introduction was, you know, to, to build a little bit on what already has been said. Why have we set ambitious targets on CCS in Equinor and why are we growing our portfolio of CCS projects? And, you know, the important backdrop is that we are on a journey to net zero. And that implies that we are investing massively into renewable energy. And this will feed into the increasing demand of electricity as more and more of the energy system is being electrified. But we also know that not all parts of the energy system can be electrified. Uh, and, and there we heard it also from the previous speakers. There is a need for solutions to serve also these uh, hard to abate segments. And an example of that is heavy industry and in steel and cement, but also long range transport and also clean power that can back up intermittency from renewable sources. And this is really where CCS comes into play. And if you look at this simple cake diagram, it just illustrates how the European energy system today is fueled by one part from electricity and then three parts from fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is dominating. And there is a reason for that. One reason for that is that it is a very good energy carrier. And to put that into perspective, only one ship loaded with natural gas can contain the same amount of energy as a whole year of production from uh, one of our offshore wind parks, Sheringham Shoal, which is a fairly large wind farm, uh, providing power to 200,000 British homes. So this is just, you know, it just gives me at least a flavor of the scale of the challenge with getting whole, all of this energy system clean. And we must really use all the tools available that can contribute with significant emission reduction in a sustainable way. Uh, so in the projects that we are developing, we are targeting these hard to abate uh, sections. And then the good thing with uh, CCS, as we heard already, is that uh, we are not starting from scratch. I mean, the technology is, is really ready and available and it's not the main barrier. On a world basis, we have 20, not we, uh, not Equinor, but there is 27 industrial CCS products in operations and many of them in the North America where you can do it on shore. But we also have unique experience in Norway, which is illustrated here on this slide. And we started offshore storage at Sleipner in 1996, so it's 25 years ago. Uh, at the time, it was the first offshore storage in the world. And then later we developed Snövi. And even today, these two projects stands out being two out of three offshore storage projects in operation on world basis. And it has really given us unique experience. And we are conscious about sharing this with society, you know, to increase confidence in CCS as a climate solution and to build the public support. But even if there is uh, only three offshore projects in operation, there are more in the pipeline. And one of them is, is Northern Lights. And I think we can really not talk about CCS without talking about Northern Lights. It's a very important project, uh, and it's part of the Norwegian full-scale CCS project called Longship, uh, also very much backed up by the Norwegian government. And when the Northern Lights partner and the Norwegian government decided to develop this project and to also take an investment decision in an oversized infrastructure, it was really uh, an essential step to kickstart the CCS market, which is also the, the goal of this project. So basically, basically, the Northern Lights project is designed to offer a CO2 transport and storage service to industry in Norway and Europe that want to capture emissions, but they need somebody to take care of it afterwards. And we are really amazed by the interest. And we see capture project being matured for a broad range of industries cement and steel, waste to energy, a lot from that sector, bioenergy, refineries, and also direct air capture. So what these industry tell us is that having this infrastructure in place uh, and somebody to take care of the CO2 uh, after it's been captured has removed a major barrier for them and then incentivized them to look into CCS. 
And the figure here to the left shows the potential customers to Northern Lights, the one that Northern Lights is in dialogue with. And four of these customers has been a pre-selected uh, for grad from the EU Innovation Fund, a really important milestone in, in November. Uh, and um, this will help this industry to make investment decisions. And if all four of these one are, are, are kind of um, realized, make investment decision, they will actually fill up this uh, oversized infrastructure in Northern Lights. Um, and, uh, and that's what, what is referred to as the phase two. So to us, this really illustrates that uh, there needs to be more storage capacity matured. Uh, and it has strengthened our belief that we have to develop a credible storage capacity to make these capture projects happen. That's an important part for, from the industry side. Uh, so we have recently announced, or not recently, this summer we announced ambition to develop CO2 storage capacity of 15 to 30 million ton a year by 2035. And it, this is, you know, 10 times the oversized capacity of Northern Lights. So you can imagine we are already on the task to develop more storage sites. And uh, um, we have recently also launched the Norway Energy Hub, uh, which is an industrial plan for Norway. Uh, where we actually ask industry and government to join forces uh, to further develop Norway and uh, as an energy nation uh, in the energy transition. Uh, and it is a plan that really utilizes the great, great advantage that Mother Nature of Norway is uh, offering us, and it builds on the industrial opportunities uh, that can serve both Norway and Europe, and the four building blocks, as you see here on the slide, where CCS is one of them. This is a plan that will require 350 billion Norwegian kuna in investment. And we are ready to contribute with 100 to make this happen. But this is not the game for one player alone. There is no player alone that can do this. But we think, you know, Norway can. Uh, Norway has done it before, if you think about it. Ave Jonsen, he was the first CIO a number one employee of Stata, you know, that's the, the name we, we had before. And he can remind us, he, he liked to tell that when he called for the first board meeting, first thing he had to do was to buy furniture to the meeting room. This was in the 1917s, and it was the start and the transition to, to Norway becoming a, a major energy player for Europe. And I can just imagine those bold goals and those strategic and courageous decisions made and the collaboration between the industry and government. I know that was one of the most important success factors. So, so to me, it tells me we can do it again, uh, but it's not a walk in the park and there is a sense of urgency. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Tobio. I, I totally agree with you that we are not starting from scratch and work is already underway and and your detailed description on the Northern Lights project. Thank you. I would like to now introduce Dr. Philip. He leads the CC, CCUS R&D team at Total Energies. Prior to joining Total Energies, Philip was the research director at the National Center for Scientific Research in France. His long-term research focus has been porous materials, capture and storage of gases and vapors. I welcome you, Philip, to inform us about the state of the art in CCS. Over to you. So yes, yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. Um, lovely to be here uh, with, some, with some lovely panel, men pan panel members. Um, I think my, my message today is, is it, I'm going to focus on R&D. Uh, so R&D is, is, is hoping to, to help with some of today's problems, but also uh, work on tomorrow's solutions. Um, so effectively, uh, I think everybody else has said that we can start today, uh, which is great, and we should, and everybody's doing so, but we can do better with time, and that's where we still need R&D. So before I talk about R&D in general, um, I just wanted to show that uh, the Total Energies is also uh, very happy to, to, to work in the, in, in the North Sea. We've just heard about the Northern Lights uh, project, um, in which we are lucky to be partners with, with Shell and Equino. 
Um, but there are, are other well-known um, storage uh, projects ha ha uh, happening in the North Sea. So the Northern Endurance Partnership uh, with the UK, uh, Aramis, uh, which is one of the projects uh, 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 which is being pushed by the Netherlands, and Bifrost, which is a project which has just been announced in December uh, from Denmark. So the North Sea is the place to be, at least to start, uh, and to understand storage, uh, at least offshore. Um, so it's, it's fine to, 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 to get all these storage option, options. Um, if we look to the future, uh, if we said that at the moment, more than Northern Lights is uh, looking to, to store 1.5 million tonnes per year of CO2, and in the future, if we go to phase two, then 5 million tonnes per year. And we can also see the numbers here on the right-hand side for Aramis and Bi for Bifrost, for example. Um, what we have to do in terms of uh, understanding where we have to go in the 2030s and the 2050s is go to the gigaton scale in terms of storage uh, around the world. So the, 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 the step up is actually, is actually quite huge. And this step up can, can't be done on, our, on, on, on ourselves. It has to be done, I think, through joint ventures, uh, just as the previous uh, speaker said. The other thing uh, that we can see here uh, are one or two sites where we're already starting to look at uh, capture from, from some of these uh, refinery sites. So that is also being uh, also starting. And again, as the previous speaker said, I think storage is, is going to be key. Um, and there's a study, I think it was last, last month or this, or at least this month, January, uh, from Carbon Limits and the Clean Air Task Force. Uh, and they were saying that even by 2030, we're going to need uh, we're only going to have about 40% uh, storage potential with respect to what's, what we will need in terms of projects that have already been talked about in terms of capture. So there is this big gap between what we can capture and what we can store. And I think storage is the, is the, is the place that we should all work on. Um, having said that, uh, the, other, the other thing that people are looking at is in terms of business. And the Allied Market Research, uh, I think again this week or last week, uh, published a, a study uh, where they're saying that um, the actual business around CCUS uh, will increase uh, uh, quite significantly from uh, around the 2020s to uh, 2030. And in 2030, there will be a business for CCUS of around $7 billion. So it's uh, something in terms of business which could be huge. So if I turn to R&D, so what are the challenges? What are, what are the opportunities? So, of course, CCS is possible today. Um, in terms of storage, we should be able to learn from past and current deployments. And again, as the previous speaker said, a lot of the data is public. So, so from Sleipner for Snowvit, we can we can work work on previous data um, in terms of uh, understanding uh, what has what has happened. Uh, ourselves at Total Energy, we work, we worked on a, a full uh, CCS. Um, uh, from storage, uh, from, sorry, from from capture to storage and, and transport, just just to show that the whole solution was possible uh, in, in LAC. Um, we should also learn from projects which have stopped. So things like in in Sala, uh, even if it's not a CO2 storage project, the the, the natural gas storage project, project Castor, uh, which was stopped, Petronova, which was also stopped. We have to learn from why these projects stopped. Uh, it also, in terms of helping to de-risk the future. Of course, going around the world, looking at some of the other projects that are, which, are, which, are, which are running now, uh, including those uh, in, in Japan, uh, in, uh, in Canada uh, and Australia, of course. So future de deployment at scale is needed. It's, it's a huge step up, as I said, and it's going to need further de-risking. Um, and each site has its own specific problems, so it's no point going into details. But, uh, and there are many, many problems still to look at and still to de-risk. Um, we need to put together in terms of R&D predictive tools, uh, what happens when you inject, what happens close to the well bore, for example, what happens in plume migration. Uh, and this is all going to be leading to regulatory acceptance. Uh, and, and, and it's key to one of the points that we should look at later. Um, the other thing in terms of the whole, the whole, the full chain from capture to storage is doing things like life cycle analysis. We really need to show that we are greener uh, and, and green it by how much, you know, what percentage are we greener? Are we becoming negative? We'll talk about a negative emission uh, solutions later. And this is going to be linked to social acceptance. And of course, things have to be cheaper. Uh, and this is where we can, I think we can talk about industrial acceptance. Um, so things have to be cheaper. We actually have numbers. The DOE says that uh, CCS or CCS change chains, even for direct air capture, should be less than $100 per tonne of CO2 captured and stored. 
Um, there are specific points to work on, for example, materials. In terms of transport, uh, if we come back to Northern Lights, for example, we should better transport with larger ships. And that creates problems because going to larger ships, ships means going to um, lower pressures, but also much lower temperatures. Um, in terms of architecture, the integration of the full chain is, is, is key. Uh, again, this is site specific. And the idea to work in joint ventures uh, in hubs, uh, in terms of uh, sharing infrastructure, I think is also important. So in terms of development, these are things we have to understand before, before moving forward. So on the right hand side, so these are some, uh, uh, on, on the top here, you can, sharing data is just showing that how sharing data is important. Understanding uh, and history match some of our tools with, for example, what happened with the sniper plume, for example, and why did it move northwards? Um, and the sort of things that we can start to be doing are simulation tools. And this is a simulation tool where we're looking at one specific site, 25 years injection, and then trying to understand what could happen to the CO2 after 200, 200 years post injection. So these are the sort of timelines we're talking about uh, in uh, hundreds of kilometer scales. So the R&D should also look to the future. Um, there's still room to be disruptive. There's still room to have uh, new things coming coming through. Uh, and one of the areas, of course, is capture because it's still considered the most ex expensive brick. Um, membranes, uh, looking to things like adsorption. So the OGCI talked about Svante, and this is a very small Svante apparatus, which is uh, which is um, running at the moment in our, in our laboratories in Pearl in the southwest of France. And this is Jean Patrick uh, playing around with one of the valves by the looks of it. But in terms of solvents, for example, we can look at uh, re re rotating pack bed contactors. If you want to get smaller and lighter, membrane contactors. So there are lots of different areas where we can work on. One of the things that I'm really interested in is, is looking at computational chemistry and physics to really understand the phenomena so that we can do things better in the future. And then, of course, we can be uh, disruptive in terms of processes. Um, as we've heard, that the, the A mines have been known since the in, since the 1930s, but in, in, up until the 70s and up until at least very very recently, A mines have been used uh, to treat uh, natural gas, and this is in a closed loop system. Whereas we, whereas in, for anthropogenic capture, we're in a more open loop system. So we have to think about uh, and, and we have to um, make sure that we do risk uh, the, the, this uh, this uh, this question. But there are other processes, for example, molten carbonate fuel cells, and this is work carried out uh, at Fuel Cell Energy, sponsored by Exxon, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, chemical looping combustion, something that we're interested in, uh, and working in a, in a European project with some Chinese partners, uh, with, again, with a, one of the key points is a, a, a new materials as an as a, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a oxygen carrier, for example. And then, of course, the future, if you want to get to negative emissions and if you want to get to net zero, which is what we're hoping to see uh, here, uh, we're going to need a negative emission solutions because there are going to be hard to abate uh, emissions. Uh, and if we look to, to bioenergy, capture and storage, things like network infrastructure are, are really important. And source to sink matching is also uh, crucial. Direct air capture, we just heard about recently as well. Um, learning from the, the carb fix project. Um, very, very difficult to, to do at scale, at what the gigaton scale, for example. But things in terms of direct air captures, the energy type, does it need to be green, uh, is, is something that's very, very important. And again, life cycle analysis is, 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 is key. And then coming back to, to things in terms of negative emission solutions, what are the regulatory aspects? How do we qualify something to be negative emission or not? So that is something that is uh, uh, on the table now, and, and, and I think a lot of people are working on. Then, of course, in the future, what is the price of CO2 going to be? Um, we already know that the uh, European trading system for CO2, I think just before Christmas, was uh, at around 90 euros per tonne of CO2. Um, and in the future, will, we, will there be different prices for, for grey CO2, uh, for green CO2, for, so from biological sources, or for CO2 from direct air capture? And this is something we could factor in in terms of understanding where we should go in the future. So these are the discussion points that I'd uh, I'd like to share with you, and uh, I, I take uh, I leave the floor to the to the next person. Thank you, thank you, Philip. Thank you so much for uh, sharing the projects in addition to Northern Lights in the Northern Sea, and also your uh, details on the actual R and D and research in the CCS projects itself. Thank you. I now welcome Emil, the chair of CCS committee at ONS. 
Emil is a business analyst at Acker Carbon Capture with responsibility for strategic market insight. He previously worked at Shell and was seconded to business development in Northern Lights, helping to shape the future market for CCS. Over to you, Emil. Big thanks, and uh, thank you to all the previous presenters for the insight and knowledge, and thank you to everyone dialing in to follow this webinar. And a big thank you for the invitation both to TCS and ONS. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I represent a, a quite a young company in, in this respect. Uh, AK Carbon Capture as a company is only one and a half years old, and we classify ourselves as a startup. But the technology that we provide is uh, not that young. It's actually comes from decades of development. So in terms of just shortly who we are, uh, Aiken Carbon Capture and our technology is developed all the way back from uh, the Slightner uh, project and within the Aiken portfolio. So our project comes from Aiken Solutions, but seeing the momentum and the need to develop CCS at scale, Aiken has decided to split out and spin out this company as a separate pure play CCS company to enable that growth to happen. So our only purpose to exist as a company is to help scale up this industry at speed. And we're doing that through our technology, which is a post combustion amine based capture with a favorable S26 solvent uh, and capture rates up towards 95%. Uh, key industries that we're looking to are typically the same as been mentioned here before it's uh, cement, hydrogen, uh, waste to energy, biomass, and uh, gas to power and also typically in the same regions that we talked about in, in Northern West Europe. But we also see uh, with the incentives that James presented earlier, also see very interesting things happening in, in North America. In terms of what's needed in the market, uh, when we talk about decarbonisation and maybe especially CCS, uh, it's often talked about the, the need for innovation is always addressed. And cost reductions will be and should be a topic that will continue to be here for decades to come. But in, in our opinion, the, the true innovation when it comes to CCS right now is deployment. We need deployment at scale in order to build this market quickly. So our ambition as a company, if you if you will, our, our North Star that we're guiding ourselves after and is the, the 10 in 25 goal. So by saying this as a company, we want to have 10 million tons on contract by 2025 and we we are trying to cooperate with the rest of the partners in the market uh, to enable this to happen um, in terms of ambitions i think that if you look at the ccs market as a whole um, and also to echo what james said in the previously here he said we can't have success if it takes eight years to to get to one megaton i i couldn't agree more and if you look at what IPCC, uh, IEA and other knowledgeable parties are saying about the market, they see it maturing typically towards the end of the 2020s and also into the 2030s. So that's when we typically have a market. What we want to do is, is to push that curve forward. So basically maturing that market uh, earlier with up to two, three and even four years, seeing that market growth already from, from 2025. And having looked at the at the projects globally and also some of them presented here, you see Northern Lights coming online in, in 2024. You have interesting projects both in the Netherlands, in the UK, here in North uh, Northwest Europe. But if you add those capacities together, it's quite clear that the, the, the chicken and egg phenomenon is still there. We need more uh, more parties to actually take that risk uh, and being uh, active in actually shaping that market. So the exciting thing with, with working with, with carbon capture uh, and providing solutions for that is that you get exposed to a range of products and you actually see and experience firsthand the need and drive for CCS across a range of industries. Uh, you see some of the ones we are involved with here, uh, and I think it's safe to say that we, we are not knocking on doors. Uh, the door to our office is rather being run down in terms of the interest in CCS, and it's been great to see the momentum over the last few years, especially uh, since 2019. And that's much thanks to, to projects, for example, like the Northern Lights, which has been mentioned here in the past. Uh, I'm also going to mention two specific ones, which might be of interest and relevance in terms of the business models that we're talking about. It's the Norsum Cement Factory, uh, which also is a part of the Longship project in Norway, which is going to be the first 
large commercial scale uh, carbon neutral cement uh, production in, in the world. And uh, this is 400,000 tons per annum of cement that will be uh, with CCS. But and below that, you see a, um, a CCU project, actually. So this is Twents uh, in the Netherlands, where you have a waste to energy um, plant, which has is now building a, a JustCat 100 uh, module, basically capturing 100,000 tons per annum. Uh, and the CO2 itself will go into greenhouses in the region as a specific example. And this also brings in the talking about business models. Um, there's a lot of good research out now looking at, for example, with the, the actual price of cement, which with CCS could go up to actually about 70% higher, but the actual price of the end product is only between 0.5 to 1% more. That's one uh, way of looking at the end product angle of, of business models for CCS. And the other one is, of course, when you, you, when you put a U to it, the utilization piece, but still, this needs to come in uh, come in place with with the total decarbonisation budget that you're trying to achieve. Also, going to mention the ha exciting things happening in the UK. Uh, then we're taking next step in terms of scale. Uh, for example, here the uh, the net zero T side project. We're talking million tons, uh, several million tons of scale on that one. Of course, very important in terms of building the market. But I think we're all alluding to the same point here and looking at the survey that went around after the first presentation it looked like 38 percent everyone agreed that the business models is what is needed and the market momentum that we've seen over the the past two three years has been phenomenal there's been some great news on ccs recently but this should be and can be uh, only the start of what needs to come so I borrowed a, a what I find to be a very good slide from the Global CCS Institute, where they've highlighted the, the growth in the market of, of last years. And as you see, the, the curve is going straight up since uh, 2017, basically. But if you look at the, the red line here, the actually operational sites, this is still quite stagnant. This is flat. Uh, and we see the market momentum is building. Uh, there are lots of projects in early development, advanced development. This is great. But the CCUS market as it is right now is still projected to, to mature a bit too late if we are to reach the goals, for example, pointed to by the IEA, who points to the, the 1.3 uh, gigatons needed in, in 2030. And also looking at the recent examples and successes by the Innovation Fund in Europe, where we had four out of seven projects be, uh, being CCS related who was funded. That's great. But still, out of the 311 applicants who went into the first round of the, um, of the Innovation Fund, only about 2% of those came out with actual success at the end. So the funding and nurture of actually re relying on, on funding, we, we need to get around that. And also, there's a point here with the mid-scale market being not addressed. We're going for the big ones. That's great. But there's lots of emitters out there who's going to need CCS. So I'm just going to mention at the end here, we say new commercial models are needed uh, at AK Carbon Capture. We're really proud to have announced now in September last year, the, the Carbon Capture as a Service, uh, where we're basically trying to supply the whole model as a whole to a paper ton model, linking that to the, the ETS or the national carbon price. But this brings up the point that we can't do this alone. As we as a company, we are supplying carbon capture equipment. And we're saying here that we will supply the whole chain. So that doesn't mean that we are supplying the transport and storage piece, for example. We're doing that through strategic partnerships with partners who want to build this market together with us and see both the upside and the risk are willing to take part in that. So I think uh, looking at the future business models, I look forward to the discussion and, and forming strategic partnerships that will enable this market to go forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Emil. So this concludes our first section of the roundtable where each of the panelists have, have shared their views and uh, how we can scale up CCS. Uh, we now move on to the second panel, which is the Q&A section. This is to be conducted by Deepak Gupta. He's the head of sustainability for the energy and resources business of Tata Consultancy Services, that is TCS. He's passionate about energy transition and sustainable ecosystems and always has interesting questions to ask. Over to you, Deepak. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as we begin the Q&A, if I may, 
ask everybody to go over to the chat and look up at the poll and throws up very interesting results. I think uh, Emil just referred to those as well. Uh, about 40% of the audience thinks that business model and potentially options like carbon pricing are the largest challenge and the solution pathway to CCAS. <clears throat> Another quarter of the audience, roughly 26%, uh, weighs in on policy and regulatory acceptance as the main barrier. And then we come down to investment capital and cost being roughly at par, 12 to 13% each. And interestingly, technology makes up the last space, although you could also argue if I uh, go by what Philip said, that while every, all other options are about today, technology could potentially improve the future of all of these options for tomorrow. So since we have limited time, I'll go straight to the heart of the matter. Um, let me begin with you, James. Uh, you spoke about the 1.5C consistent scenarios and the demands it places on net zero and uh, accelerating the race to net zero with CCS. Uh, could you share with us any insight on how do we size the role of CCS in that overall ambition? How much capacity do you think we're going to need by 2050? Oh, that's uh, that's a great question. I think I'd, I'd probably have to, uh, I think I'd probably have to, to make a guess, which I'm a, a little bit hesitant to do. Um, but let me answer the question this way, uh, in that, um, if you think back to to the chart that I had that shows all the different sectors that that are producing emissions, and the way I presented that, um, the electricity and heat component for some of those industries was included in each of them. So, if you take out agriculture, and you look at the rest, that that basically shows that seventy five percent of the uh, emissions that are currently being produced. Um, so we're talking about north of 35 gigatons. There is an element of CCS that can help reduce them. And uh, it, it's not as, it, it really shouldn't be as difficult as, as people think. And um, I was really pleased by Emil's point about the end product because that, that's actually one of my, my hot button topics, particularly when we talk about policy. Um, so much of what we talk about policy incentives, we're usually talking about it at, say, the federal level, you know, at, at you know, the, the nation state level um, in the U.S. But when you think about there, there's policy initiatives that can happen at the local level when, uh, you know, local governments and state governments are doing infrastructure projects. Um, they can make a huge difference by. Um, but by demanding um, low carbon, um, uh, low carbon products, in, you know, building products in these infrastructure projects, um, and if if they just use carbon intensity as a scoring, um, then you might have the end product for a bridge or a road being, you know, a, a very small percentage cost increase, but that will make such a difference in the gigaton scale of reducing carbon. And uh, most of those building products would use uh, an element of CCS to produce a lower carbon product such as cement and steel. Thank you for that, James. I think that's insightful. You're essentially saying that demand in some of these sectors could push the case for CCS to help decarbonize. I, that, I, that I agree. In, in fact, I, I would say um, it's essential for demand to, to be involved. If, if we if I look at, at all the different types of, uh, you know, emission trading schemes that we've had, uh, you know, for, for different pollutants for the last, you know, 30 years, um, the ones that have really worked have been the ones that were driven by demand, not not by uh, heavy handed, uh, uh, you, you know, supply push. Wonderful. Thank you for that view. If I may just take that and come over to you, uh, Lena, um, you spoke about decarbonization of the heavy industry sectors in your remarks. You mentioned hard to bit sectors like steel and cement metals is something you're personally working with. How do you see CCS scale up into a, a viable option for decarbonizing these sectors? So one of the things um, that I observe when we have these conversations and also with various major steel companies is it's of course also depending on in which region they're located, what yeah. are their CCS options? Because we, we, of course, 
we, we talked about there are a backbone in some countries and, and uh, Torbjörg very nicely showed how beautifully it laid out the backbone in, 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 in Norway, but also uh, to the UK and to various parts of Europe, but of course also parts of the world where that backbone is not there yet. So then you need to think about when you discuss with them, where are the options and also in the surroundings, where could we then store it or are we thinking of the ships transporting it? So that's one where um, depending on which uh, tailor-made solution for them could be done, then you also need to think of the infrastructure supporting it. And uh, that's also, um, I think it was Philip that also mentioned uh, in the comment list about the social acceptance, because that's also very various depending on which country you're in, how accepted the CCS is seen as a decarbonizing solution. And that's, of course, something we feel, but also um, the hard to abate sectors and in specific some of the companies in, in their license to operate, some of them are also confronted with what does the public think of that as a solution to decarbonize. So there, there are many aspects of, of how, how it can be done, but one that I see certainly for some is uh, if the infrastructure is there for it or if you have to create it, how can you then make it happen and, and how do you, and, and I think, I'm, I don't know if I emphasize it enough, but I think it was also mentioned um, by one of the previous speakers about how these partnerships become so relevant. Because that's, of course, what you saw with uh, with the nice slides from Torbjörg on Northern Lights, where you see several partners that we lined up together and with the Norwegian government try to create this. And this might be needed in more regions in the world, how we can help each other make this happen. Sure. Thank you for that uh, insight, uh, Lene. I'll, I just want to respect everybody's time, so I'll quickly come over to you, Philip. Uh, several points in your talk that grabbed my attention about, for example, work to do in de-risking large projects, the cost of capture still being high, and there's room to be disruptive. Uh, a slightly unfair question for you, perhaps, but with so many opportunities to innovate, what do you think is the biggest challenge to solve in CCS? I put it in the chat, social acceptance. Um, so, so, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll explain why. So sure. as we said, there, 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 there have been several projects which, are, which we are trying to learn from. Um, so one of the projects was carried out by Total Energies in, in 2010-2013. It's a LAC project, what we call LAC Rus. Um, and the idea was to, to capture quite easily, transport over 30 kilometers and, and inject. So small, relatively small amount of CO2 at low pressure under very easy conditions. But to get this project set up, very, very few technical difficulties. Only one that we found later that we had to work on, but very, very quite a small one. The biggest problems and, and why the project took uh, maybe one or two years in terms of being late in, in starting was getting people on board. Are, we, are they happy to have a, a, an existing pipe? The pipe was already there uh, and before was, was producing gas, but it was just turning it around and producing CO2. They weren't happy to have this nasty CO2. Uh, other people weren't happy to have a uh, CO2 injected underground where before they had quite a lot of sulfur. All of these things, so it, it's, it's just a case of discussing with them, explaining the, the, the uh, it's very simply the, the physics and the chemistry. And, and so that's the where I think uh, social acceptance, but I think it's also changing. One of the mayors is, is still around, who was, who was very much against the project back uh, about, uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago. Um, he was interviewed quite recently. And he said, "Well, if I knew, if I know, if I knew what then what I know now, then I wouldn't. Have, then he wouldn't have uh, been been against it so much." And I think the other learning that we can get is from the um, Japanese project, Tomokomai, where they actually have school visits to come and show. You know, they go and see the project itself, and they have actually uh, like an open center where the people can actually go up and, and and see what is happening. And I think we can, if we can be a little bit more, uh, if we have this possibility to be a bit more open then I think that's the major hurdle for me. The other things are difficult and we can work on regulatory and uh, technical aspects, business side of things. I'm, I, I'm seeing all of the, these other things falling into place. Uh, social acceptance, which is maybe why everybody's going off, uh, off, uh, offshore in, in, in Europe. Interesting. All that thought, I, I might actually come back to, uh, to you about that and to the other panelists, but thank you. That was very interesting and i'm just thinking maybe we'll come back to you and also request a visit to some of the projects that you've been involved in could be a nice uh, educational experience for 
maybe this entire panel as well. Uh, Dr. Gifam, I just quickly come to you. Your vision for that carbon capture, transport, and storage as a service looks very promising. And yet it sometimes feels that for CCS to scale up globally, it needs almost a leap of faith. So I wanted to ask you, are there any learnings from your experience in trying to build CCS as a business that you'd like to share with us? Definitely a lot of learning. Um, and I think what is clear is that uh, net zero targets that are very popular these days, they are really driving the momentum. So, I mean, with net zero targets, it implies that uh, you cannot get away with your emissions. There is nowhere to hide. Everybody must decarbonize. Yeah. And that also includes these hard to abide sectors. So I think with this line of sight, uh, more and more realize that CCS must be must happen in a way. There is actually for some mm -hmm. sectors no other options and, and it becomes a good option uh, when you actually come to, to these hard to abate segments. So then projects start to happen, even without this commercial framework in place. So steps are taken. And then with a strong belief that it will have to come in place, this commercial gap must you know, be closed in joint effort between the industry and government. And, and I think Equinor, we believe, and, and many with us, believe in a commercial CCS uh, business of at least three factors. One of them is that we, we expect the cost of emitting CO2 to increase. We already see it increasing with the EU ETS prices. And then, of course, we also uh, will see cost of implementing CCS to come down. That would be a consequence of industrialization and scale and technology improvement. And particularly on the transport and storage, there is a huge potential to, to uh, utilize economy of scale and then, then also, uh, we also uh, believe that a market for low carbon products it will grow. But what we have to just be very conscious about is that there is a commercial gap for the first wave of project. They will need help. They will be, need funding and pos pol uh, policy facilitation. But they must happen because they are the project that really paves the way test the regulatory and the commercial framework and make, you know, this commercial business happen without subsidies not too far in the future. Interesting. So it's almost like uh, startups paving the way with the addition of technology and we get mature. Um, thank you for that insight. Uh, Emil, if I may quickly come to you, uh, the panel spoke about the scale of the challenge and large capacities and something in your presentation caught my eye, which was that the mid market is not served too well. And I was wondering, uh, how do you see that need for smaller to good scale projects, perhaps for smaller emitters? So, um, good question. If you if you look at the uh, the emission points across Europe, uh, above 100,000 tons, typically where CCS starts to make commercial sense, uh, and you you filter that on, on typically what I would classify as the mid scale market from 100,000 to 250,000, you end up somewhere between uh, 600 and 700 different emission points across Europe. So it, there's a, it's a huge market in that respect. Uh, in terms of then, of course, um, the cost per ton typically goes goes down with, with larger volumes, depending on location. But I think what we're coming back to again and again is that much of the cluster thinking that we're also seeing now for the larger volumes needs to be applied also for, for, for this mid-scale mid market. So thinking jointly, joint infrastructure in terms of how you set up the logistics and also joining together these, these industries. And also, of course, in terms of the solutions and technology that you apply in this mid-scale market, there's a larger potential, I would say, for standardized and modularized solutions compared to maybe the, the, the big scales where you typically need the, the EPC tailored contracts to actually to capture the whole million ton scale products. So you can actually Thanks. start by, it's an opportunity to actually start that modular uh, standardization journey for CCS with this mid-scale market. So essentially, and then you replicate that standard across projects. Okay, interesting thought there as well, thank you. Uh, what I was thinking is on the two main challenges that the audience Paul brought up, maybe we can have a common question go across the panel. I'll, I think Philip already commented partly on this about the social acceptance. And I think almost every panelist spoke about the need for policy support for CCS. 
Uh, yet sometimes there is this perception that CCS may allow continued use of fossil fuels, and that perception does not help in gaining policy support sometimes. How do you think that uh, CCS can gain wider policy and regulatory support? What do you see as the pathways? James, if I may come to you first. Sure. Um, so it kind of goes back to the discussion that we had uh, you know, a few minutes ago uh, on the demand side. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we face this, uh, this question all the time, particularly since on the topic of business model, um, currently um, in the United States, the, and, and well, all of North America, um, the business model that is the most successful for advancing CCS is using the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. And so then, of course, there's the, the debate of, well, is, is carbon capture just uh, enabling more production of oil and gas? Well, in my opinion, that's not the case because um, it's, it's the, the oil is only going to be produced to the extent that demand requires it. And uh, a technology that is making the same volume of uh, oil and, and fossil fuels uh, you know, produced uh, have a lower footprint, that is a net benefit. Now, uh, it, you know, and, and I don't think that as we're talking about energy transition, um, it, it's a good use of our time to be focused on ways to just, you know, cut off fossil fuel, uh, you know, production altogether. So anything we can do in this race that we're in to start reducing the carbon footprint today is a worthwhile endeavor. Thank you, James. Linda, would you like to offer an opinion on, on this? That How do we see the policy and regulatory acceptance improving? Married to the social acceptance. So I I think that uh, the social acceptance is, is one that we are certainly, um, you say, confronted with. But coming back to the policy and, and advocacy in that space, I think that some countries have already shown, like Canada and Norway, that with the right policies, they can actually drive some of these things to happen. And I think this is one that could also help even get it accelerated if more um, countries would um, would look at their policies and perhaps support some of this. And at the same time, what is also sharing in the chat, how can we make sure that we, um, without sounding arrogant, educate people in um, I think it was Philip also mentioning it that, that that why it's safe, but also some can and how it can be stored safely, how we can perhaps even transport it safely. So um, not knowing can easily make that a fact is becoming an opinion instead. And I think we have some we could leverage some of the knowledge we have, and also when you are going for such a project or want to drive such a project, that we make sure that our society around us also understand the opportunity but also um, that we will not propose it if it's not safe. And, and I think that's something, yeah, I think with the policies that it's not just the policy driving it, it's also how do we communicate in the right way. What we're trying to do is a part of the energy transition and it will help us decarbonize and also uh, try to uh, get our Paris Agreement uh, delivered like we promised or perhaps even below the one and a half. But it is a challenge, but I think there's uh, some facets in there that we could do and the policies would certainly help and support it. Thank you. Lene, Tobia, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, agree in everything that has been said, uh, so not to repeat anything of that. Yes, one of the one of the uh, interesting uh, uh, you know, ways to get uh, commerciality out of CCS is also this uh, market for low carbon products. And just an example of that, it was really one of an eye opener for me when I, I learned this. But um, if you, if you, for example, uh, want to produce uh, and sell clean steel, you could do that with CCS and with blue hydrogen, but it will cost, it will lead to your uh, steel costing like 50% more than, you know, normal way of producing steel. So that sounds not very viable. 
But then if you look at where the steel ends up, for example, in a car, you will only see, you know, a very small increase on the cost of the car. Uh, and if you take an example, assuming that you have one ton of uh, clean steel going into a car, you would typically see an increase of the cost of the car on 200 euros. And the reason for that is the cost of producing a car is made up by many things like uh, assembly and profit to the company and uh, supplier cost and logistic. So, I mean, this is also a way to, to, to commercialize uh, uh, CCS. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, customers, car customers, they are willing to pay extra for a specific color and leather seats. Like way beyond 200 euros, so why shouldn't we be willing to pay extra for a carbon neutral car? So that's also one aspect of this. Well, that's interesting because you talk about one journey of that metal in a car. And if you take a circular economy, we view both steel and aluminum for that matter are almost infinitely recyclable. So even that uh, uh, cost of carbon essentially is getting spread over multiple lifetimes in that sense. So that's interesting thought. Uh, Emil, anything you would like to offer? We will. Yeah, happy to add and uh, very good points made already on especially the social acceptance piece, uh, both in terms of the, the need for some education in terms of what CCS is and what it's doing and also the, the end product. But I think one thing that we also need to, to drive in and which I believe we could be better at is the element of creating jobs. So CCS as a opportunity to actually both create new jobs, but also kind of future proofing existing jobs across Europe. So Bologna, for example, is, is very good at highlighting the, the need for CCS to actually future proof industry across Europe and maintain production within the continent. So I think what well, if you look at kind of the public perception piece uh, and outside kind of the CCS silo, what creates the, the positive attention around the dinner table is when when people across uh, societies actually see that, well, there is new job opportunities coming out of this CCS uh, technology that they're talking about. So I think as an industry, we should be even better at pinpointing both those new exciting projects that come on into in terms of new jobs and being forward leading in terms of uh, bringing the, te uh, the market further, but also the, the aspect of saying, the, the factory or the production line that you work at with CCS is actually future proof in a decarbonized 2050 world. So those two elements, I think, should definitely be a part of our, our messaging. Essentially an element of a fair transition to uh, for the energy. Philip, I came to you last because you actually kind of seeded this question, so and you already yeah. commented on part of this. And I heard I saw you commenting also about another you know, potential aspect of social acceptance that there is this thought that why not go straight to green energy? Any views? Yeah, and it's and it's not one of my favourite thoughts, but I thought we should have had it in the chat anyway. Um, so yeah, so, so so we see this, and and I and again personally, and I think and I'm guessing as a company, we're we're really not for this thought. Um, why not move directly to a green energy? Why shouldn't um, some of the countries that have already uh, profited by uh, carbon and, and fossil fuel energy uh, help other countries in terms of uh, going directly to, to, to green energy economy. So I think some of that is being done. But in terms of increasing energy needs, uh, it's, it's difficult. And I think one of the other speakers said it's very, very difficult to, to, to not go via the, 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 the fossil step at some point. Uh, the, the question then is uh, which which fossil is acceptable, which fossil fuels are acceptable, uh, uh, and that again is a, is, a, is a very very tricky question which I'd have difficulty in, in answering. But we can all, we could always say maybe for example natural gas is is cleaner than coal or something like that. I think I'd, I'd like to go back to the other to, the, to your first the, the point that was just before. It was much easier for me, um, and I like the idea of jobs, and I and I like the idea. Uh, we can debate about EOR uh, as an enabler, as a, as a storage enabler, maybe. 
But the one thing that we didn't see is that consumers uh, and, and some policies is, uh, is already driving us in, in many cases. And, and there are two, two examples. One, we hear of car manufacturers not producing um, petrol engines or uh, thermal engines from 2030 onwards. I think that's one thing that's pushing us forward. And the other are places like Denmark. I don't know whether you saw that, that, that Denmark is not going to accept um, fossil um, aviation fuel from 2030 as well. So all of their all of their aviation fuel will have to be renewable av aviation fuel. So we, we're actually being pushed in the right direction, I think, from the uh, from a consumer point of view and from a regulatory point of view, and hopefully that's going to accelerate. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I'll come to the last question, and that is that comes straight from the audience poll in the sense that was highlighted as the top challenge, which is the model uh, business model part of it. And basically, the thought there is that for CCS to be a commercial business that attracts private investment, some form of carbon pricing is going to be necessary. And so far, a few governments do promote uh, a carbon pricing policy and have roadmaps for it. But how do you see carbon pricing adoption take off, especially in major energy producing economies? Uh, James, again, if I may come to you first, because you deal often with policy issues. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I had a, an audio glitch. Can you just r repeat the last part of the question, please? Sure, so I was basically asking that if carbon pricing is, uh, is necessary for CCS to become a commercial business, how do you see carbon pricing adoption take off, especially in major energy producing economies? Yeah, I no, no, great, great question. Um, so, um, it it all comes down to that, um, it, you know, human nature is that we respond to incentives, and uh, <laughs> so, um, it, you know, there there absolutely needs to be carbon pricing. Uh, there's very little argument about that and there's so many different ways where where it can um you know where where it can be uh, deployed i think that um carbon pricing that carbon pricing should be uh essentially deployed at the wholesale level and passed on to end customers um and i believe that there is um generally support for that uh because uh i would look to the renewable energy uh, business as an example where, um, you, you know, 10 years ago, uh, very, very large electricity consumers started demanding uh, and, and originating purchases from wind and solar projects that at the time were more expensive than fossil fuels in the United States. And that created um, you, you know, a large supply that eventually brought the, uh, the the cost down. And now, in many parts of the U.S., the lowest cost without subsidies of producing electricity is wind and solar. And mm -hmm. that has created a virtuous cycle where the bold consumers who were demanding the more expensive but more virtuous product have now created a situation where they are purchasing the same virtuous product at a lower cost. And uh, I, I see that that with uh, you know fuels and building products and and really all uh, products and services that have carbon intensity, we we should have the the major uh, suppliers of goods and services taking the same action. Wonderful thought there, James. Uh, Philip, if I may come to you next, you point to industrial acceptance cost and those issues. If you have a view on um, what does research show carbon price on carbon price? Yeah, a difficult one for me. And, and I know that there are projects around the world. So there's one called uh, uh, CCS Plus. So uh, a whole group of people coming together to try to get through this carbon pricing. What is the price of carbon? What is the decrease in carbon intensity? And how can how can we work on that? So I, I, I'm looking more to, 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 and I think we're funding part of part of this initiative carried out by a third party. Not much tried to that. Um, but what was interesting is when we look at direct air capture for the future. At the moment, Kleinworks uh, with uh, Carbfix, uh, I think they're. Um, I think, I think the price per, per ton of CO2 is around thousand dollars or thousand euros. It's the sort of ballpark. Um, and if we are get, and, and I think that they're. Um, 
the, the commands they they already have I think for t already two or three years ahead of schedule in terms of uh, people you know paying into this service, uh, and that could be I think uh, from what we've just heard from uh, from James might uh, give us uh, food for thought or comfort for the future. I think that if people are prepared to pay so much for for CO two capture from the air, then maybe as we get prices down um, and the industry gets bigger in general, then maybe we maybe on the way to move forward in, in, in more to in, in a more virtuous fashion, at least for some of the CO2. Sure, thank you. Uh, Emily, I think you mentioned uh, government funding being a limitation, for example, on one of the slides as well. Any views on how pricing might pan out? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's of course a key question. How will that look? Everyone's wondering, uh, wondering how that will be driving going forward. Uh, I think there's two elements of this. Of course, the, the carbon pricing is one, and everyone was surprised in terms of the, the rise of DTS last year, how, how high that actually went. Uh, many analysts are, of course, out there uh, saying a lot of things as how on that will go forward. Uh, I think yeah, many interest want, uh, interesting want to know, uh, Berenberg being one of the ones who who say some some interesting things on the curve going forward, but they also highlight a element which we have touched upon briefly here, and that's the, the the piece of kind of the public outcry towards too high ETS prices. If if those go through the roof, where we're talking 100, 150 plus, what that could potentially do to uh, to costs of utilities and energy. So so that's one element to be aware of. I think what's very exciting and kind of in terms of building the business case is also what what was touched upon uh, briefly here by Philip is terms of the biogenic piece. So the, the value of CO2, uh, the EU has now said that they will come out with a, a value on biogenic CO2 and uh, some frameworks around that by the end of this year, 2022. And if you combine then the, the, the price of, of um, uh, emitting CO2, fossil CO2, and then the potential value of biogenic CO2 and add those two together, uh, we're starting to look at interesting business cases, for example, like uh, waste to energy industries. Any brief comments, Lena? We... So I, I'm, I must say it's, it's um, I, I, I will share one thing. I played a game quite recently uh, and it was uh, a game that one of the banks have made where you actually play government and you play industry and you played electricity producers and then you have to play with what does a carbon tax means what does and right. it was unbelievable how small a carbon tax how effective it could be <laughs> in what we saw so um but what was coming back and there was perhaps the the largest discussion we had afterwards is like how do you then make it happen a carbon tax how do we make it a level playing field because uh, agreeing globally on this and and also knowing that some countries um, perhaps do not monitor this that co2 as much so that was actually the largest discussion afterwards so um i do not have a lot to add to what the previous speaker said but it is not an easy one that's the only thing i really Put at the back of my head, but it could be an effective one if we could get a level playing field. Maybe we need a massive online game for all of us to play, and then we'll. I can recommend it. It was really um, you got a lot of insights. Yeah. Okay. So, have any last comments on uh, because this could be the I guess a critical piece for some of these as a storage projects uh, that you're running right now. Uh, I think what's been said is is uh, is I, is very 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 wise. I agree to that. And but I think it's uh, carbon pricing is working. It's it is effective. And uh, and if you think about it, how effective it can be. It was really carbon taxes in Norway introduced in the 1990s that led to the realization of slight non So it's just examples that carbon taxes they do work if it gets um, if it costs more to to pay taxes and emit then you will seek other solutions yeah. thank you uh, lovely discussion panels you my family just come back to you you have the privilege of working with leaders from energy producers to major energy consumers like metals and mining and epc firms that build these assets so in closing today's roundtable, I'm requesting you to share your observations and summarize and close the discussion, perhaps. Thank you so much, Deepak.
I think today uh, the depth and the breadth of discussion that we've had has been so enlightening. Uh, I think it's because of the level of insight and the level of experience and the expertise that we have across the panel today. I think we discussed various dimensions of CCS, whether it is in terms of the policy and the regulatory support, the social acceptance, the job creation, the new commercial models that could be there, new commercial models for carbon capture, new models for carbon transportation and storage, and of course, innovation and technology. I think uh, I, if I would like to just summarize some of the points uh, that we have anyway said is, first and foremost is that CCS is going to play a key role in the race to net zero. And as it is also mentioned in the, uh, in the IPCC reports, second one is that the commercial models around CCS are still evolving uh, and have to encourage private investment to scale it up. Third one is that there are still open questions uh, regarding policy and regulation. Hence, there is room for disruption in CCS. And lastly, CCS is an ecosystem play. No single company or industrial sector can succeed alone. And it is this ecosystem that I would like to stress upon more because I see that as three interconnected ecosystems, right? The first is the agile innovation ecosystem, which is an ecosystem between technology and innovation. It's the field for engineers and the scientists. It is this ecosystem which will drive the improvements in CCS technology and also new ways of implementing it in multiple industrial sectors. The second uh, ecosystem is the data-driven ecosystem. Data is the foundation for transparency. And transparency in terms of emitted emissions and also transparency in tracking the data stream across the value stream of energy is going to be key. CCS project results, if they are transparent, would also help getting in policy and regulatory support. And the third ecosystem is the finance ecosystem, which actually links the limited carbon emissions to the price of carbon. And we've discussed a lot on that. And this system will set the carbon credits generated and create effective incentives for carbon reduction. It is clear to me that technology is the fabric on which these three ecosystems will thrive. Whether it is accelerated innovation, whether it is encouraging data transparency and seamlessly integrating into the finance. And companies like us and Organizations like us, like ONS and TCS, have the responsibility to foster and flourish these ecosystems. That was my small conclusion that I had. I thoroughly enjoyed the panel discussion and the comments uh, and the insights that were shared by all of you. And uh, a very, very big thank you to James, Lene, Torbjorn, Philip, Emil, Leaf, and Deepak. And a huge thank you to our audience who have made this roundtable possible. We will make the recounting of this roundtable available very soon. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you all.